All right. Uh, and can people just confirm that they made it okay? And we can move on to part two, where we're going to start analyzing recursion in more depth and, and look at uh, how the stack works, which is a really interesting little part of understanding recursive algorithms. So uh, again, if you have any lingering questions, just throw them in and I will answer them uh, as I can. So here we go, let's jump into it. All right, so uh, you probably saw this with some frequency uh, and you know, hands up in your mind if you got this problem before. Uh, you see, even I got this problem when I wasn't uh, doing the uh, recursive call correctly, where I was actually putting the addition inside of the recursive call when it should have been outside of the recursive call. So what does this mean, this maximum call stack size exceeded thing? Uh, what, what is this all about? Why is this happening? So this is, this is a very important part of understanding really what recursion is and how it works. So let's look a little bit deeper at recursion and what it entails. Uh, so in order to understand recursion, we first have to understand function calling because recursion uh, is basically solving an algorithm through repeated function calling, right? Instead of iteration, obviously. So take a look at this function real quick, uh, or this chain of functions. And I'm gonna use this as an example uh, in, the, in the sort of next few slides to kind of explain a little bit about how the call stack works, how calling functions work, and how recursion works. So really briefly, you know, we go into function one, function one calls function two, function two calls function three. Uh, after the function calls, there's some console.logging, but those don't happen until the whole thing terminates. Uh, and then function three throws an error. And so there's no, there's no function defined called throw error, so that's just gonna you know, say, I don't know what throw error is, uh, it's not a function, what are you doing? So, probably predict what's gonna happen is this thing is gonna throw an error once it gets down to three. And it's not gonna print anything other than the console.log statement inside of three, which is finished function three. So here's what's happening as we're calling this function from the very beginning. Okay, so out in, you see on the left side, we call the function one, and uh, that goes into the function called one, which will eventually call function two, okay? Now at the bottom is I'm showing you this thing which is called the stack. Okay, now what is the stack? The stack is something that basically your uh, interpreter or your, you know, uh, your program is managing. And the stack is basically the way that your program keeps track of all the function calls that are going on right now, okay? It's basically where like all the information about what's going on in your program at this moment is being stored. So stuff that goes into the stack are things like local variables. All the local variables that are in scope at any given time are on the stack. Okay. Basically, wherever you are, wherever your, your current context of execution is, all the local variables or all the variables that are in scope are stored there. Okay. Uh, the other thing that it stores is like where the function is or what function it is. So you can see I have like fn is equal to 1. Okay. The other thing it stores, it stores a lot of other things, but I'm kind of simplifying here. It also stores the line number that you're currently on in your execution of the program. Okay. Um, it also has access to things like globals and constants and da 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 da. Uh, but for now, we'll just kind of simplify it here and say it has local variables, the function that you're in, and the line number that you're currently executing. Okay. Um, so inside of function one, you can see the line numbers I have them shown on the left. Uh, it says right now we're at line 17, and it stores all this on the stack. So here we call function two at line 17 inside of function one. And that jumps down into function two. And the way that it works with the stack is it pushes on, what we say is we pushes a new stack frame on top of the stack, okay? Um, so you can see this, it's like a stack of pancakes, right? Like you just put a new pancake on top and a new pancake on top and a new pancake on top. That's why it's called a stack, if you're not familiar with that phrase. Um, and basically, this new stack frame kind of, it saves at a lower level where we were in function one, because once we're done with function two, we have to go back there and we have to have access to all the local variables that we had during that time, et cetera, et cetera. But now we have function two kind of in the new scope, the new frame of reference that we're in uh, that gets pushed on top of the old one, right? Uh, and this is how a computer keeps track of all of the function calls that are sort of nested inside of each other, okay? So again, function two also has these local variables, has the line number that we're currently on, um, and of course the first line in function two is the call function three. So okay, we call function three. And function three pushes a new stack frame, which has function three, its local variables, 
and you know the line number, which is 27. Uh, the local variables include like the arguments to the function. Uh, it includes anything that the function closes over, right? Anything that's available in that scope is going to be kind of stored there on the stack. Um, now, once we get to function three, we have this console.log, and you see we have this output that comes out that says finished function three. Okay, cool. So that was at line 27. Now we increment to line 28, and at line 28, we have this throw error, right? And so now this is literally what happens when I call this function. Uh, it'll spit out this error. It'll say reference error, throw error is not defined. And what you can see is actually, so you've probably heard the term before, a stack trace. This is what a stack trace is. The stack trace is literally spitting out everything that was on the stack. The JavaScript interpreter is just showing you, just printing out you know, sort of layer by layer, everything that was on the stack. And you can see even the line numbers are matched up there. Uh, and where the file was, and et cetera, um, and the function that it was inside when you got that stack trace. Now, I'm sure every single one of you is accustomed to reading a stack trace, and you know what it, how to interpret a stack trace. Uh, but you might not have had that much context on what exactly a stack trace was or why it was there. This is what a stack trace is. Stack trace is just a dump of the stack at the given time that you get the error. Uh, and it's sort of in reverse order, right? It pops off things off the stack one by one until the stack is empty. Uh, and that's how it knows that the error message is complete. So let's say I, let's say I, I don't throw the error. OK, I comment that out. So I've commented out the throw error. Uh, let's go back to where we were, but pretending that the error wasn't there. Um, so it was the number after the question mark. Uh, I'm sorry, what question mark are you referring to, Joanne? After the colon. Oh, uh, yes, that's going to be the token in the line, I believe. Uh, so basically, yeah, so don't worry about the, col the colon at the end. Basically, it's like the token where this thing happened uh, because JavaScript parses. Token tokenizing is kind of complicated, but basically, it's like part of the compilation step is it divides every line into a series of tokens. And so basically, saying that like the third token on this line is where the error. Was thrown or where I was waiting after I made this recursive call. You can imagine you have like a line that has like five recursive calls on it, right? You might want to know where was I sitting when I made this recursive call, because then I have to go back to that token and then evaluate the next token and then the next token and the next token. There might be five recursive calls on one line if you're a horrible program. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's what that uh, colon three is is showing you there. Uh, good question. So uh, cool. So commenting this out. Uh, now what happens? Well, we start popping from the stack. If this is really what was going on, then we pop that last stack frame because we've reached the end of the function. If we reach the end of the function or we reach a return statement, that means we pop off the stack, okay? And uh, basically all the, you know, the function, the local variables, the line number, we can throw all that away. We don't need it anymore. We're done with that function. And all we do is we take the return value of whatever that function was and we sub it in for whatever that recursive call was, right? And then we sort of go on parsing that line. So of course, in these functions that I've written, there are no return values. Everything just returns undefined, and we're just calling the functions out of nowhere. But technically, what will happen is that this line will spit out an undefined, because its parent spit out an undefined. Or the, you know, the recursive call that it was making spit out an undefined. If it had returned a number, this would just have spit out a number. Obviously, it wouldn't have done anything with that number, but that would have been the return value. Um, so this is how function evaluation and function dispatch works inside of any stack-based language, which are most of the language that you'd be familiar with. Um, so we go back to line 22. Uh, we go on to line 23, back in that function too, right? We just keep going down in this very algorithmic way. Um, we just move line by line, evaluate each of the lines on this thing, looking at the local variables and whatnot. Uh, console log this. Then we pop this stack uh, frame. We pop this stack frame because we've reached the end of the function. Uh, we're done. This thing returns undefined because there's no return statement. And that goes back to line 17 in function one, right? One stack frame left. Uh, we console.log and done with function one. And that's it. We're done. The whole thing, you know, we eventually pop off the last stack frame, and we go back to the main function. And then eventually, the whole thing terminates. So how can we break this? This was, you know, this was really nice, and it worked really well. Uh, how can we break this model? How can we totally screw up the way that function dispatch works? Well, we could do this. Inside of that function three, 
we could call function one. Okay. This is like the snake eating its tail. If, if we do that, then after the function three, it will push on a new stack frame that's function one, right? We go back to that function three, we have that stack with three frames on it, um, we push on function one. Okay, cool. Function one has a new set of local variables, has a line number, great. Function one pulls up function two, which has local variables and a line number, great. That pushes on function three, which local variables and a line number, back to function one, and so on. It just keeps going and going and going and going. But of course, it doesn't keep going and going, right? It can't. Because eventually, we're going to run out of memory or we're going to run out of space on the stack, okay? And we were going to get what is known as a stack overflow. So a stack overflow, uh, well, actually, let's say here. So stack overflow, if you've heard this term before, basically what this means is the stack got so big that it ran out of memory, okay? Now, usually it's not literally that the stack runs out of memory. Uh, usually what it literally means when you get a stack overflow is that the stack has a hard-coded limit of how many stack frames it allows you to have. And I believe in JavaScript, it's something like 11,000 stack frames uh, in Node. But you can actually configure this. There are ways that you can go in into your compiler uh, and or your interpreter and change the number of stack frames that it limits you to. Okay, Because JavaScript doesn't literally want you to run out of memory. Running out of memory or out of memory problems are much weirder and much more unseemly. You don't really want to have that happening to you because it's just going to gobble up your machine and it's going to make everything kind of break. Uh, so it doesn't want you to do that. Basically, what JavaScript says is that, OK, if you're writing an algorithm that needs more than 11,000 stack frames, you're doing something wrong. Like, you have screwed up royally. I'm not even going to let you do that to yourself. Um, just because like, it's a much better error message to get that uh, basically there's a stack overflow, as opposed to basically having your computer slow down to a crawl, you run out of memory, maybe you have to kill a process, right? Uh, JavaScript doesn't want to do that to you. So that's why it does this. Uh, and it's just also easier to know what exactly went wrong. It wasn't that you ran out of memory in some other weird way. It was that you got a stack overflow. You recursed way too deep didn't terminate correctly in the base case, so you got a stack overflow. So does this make sense? Any questions on uh, the stack and, and uh, how the stack works and why you get stack overflows? If anybody has any questions they want to ask, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. But this is basically functionally what it means, why you were getting stack overflows when your recursive algorithm wasn't terminating correctly. It got deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, pushing more and more things onto the stack until eventually JavaScript was like, hey, no more, stop, you're out of, you're, you're, you're done, no more stack allocations for you. Okay, so that's the stack overflow. And stack overflows are the reasons why recursive algorithms cannot infinite loop. Okay, uh, and you can see actually there's a little caveat here, which is without tail recursion or explicit loops. So I don't want to go into detail about tail recursion. Uh, you can look it up if you'd like to. In uh, there's there's a lot of places we can learn about tail recursion. JavaScript doesn't natively support tail recursion. Uh, most languages are not tail recursive, but a lot lots of languages that are very uh, oriented around recursion and sort of more mathematically pristine languages tend to use tail recursion uh, in order to make recursive algorithms more uh, efficient. Uh, but you get this side effect that's not very nice, which is that you can have a recursive algorithm with an infinite loop if you have tail recursion. Um, so you know, most languages don't support tail recursion. Uh, and obviously, if you have like a recursive algorithm that has an infinite loop inside of it, like literally like a while true, then you could get an infinite loop. But you know, then what are you doing? So please don't do that. That's really dumb. Um, cool. And so it's actually really nice that recursive algorithms can't infinite loop, because infinite loops are annoying, and they're harder to debug. And it's not really as clear what happened in an infinite loop. Whereas usually, I mean, probably if you're new to recursive algorithms, then you don't really feel like stack overflows are a particularly nice way or particularly helpful in debugging. But they're actually significantly better than infinite loops. And if you are debugging in a language with tail recursion, then infinite loops can actually be way more annoying to debug than uh, stack overflows. So uh, yeah. So. You know, in many ways, it's nice to fail fast and like just get to see where what was going on, where was this recursing, how deep was it getting, why is this happening, um, rather than just having it sit there and not really know what happened. So this is also why recursion is sometimes, if not often, less space efficient than iteration. 
Um, so if you if you guys remember the the last presentation that I did, some some of you might not have been there. Uh, but space efficiency is sort of the um, the memory version of time complexity, right? So space efficiency, time time efficiency. Space efficiency is basically how much space does your algorithm take relative to the input, okay? And you can probably gain some intuition for why uh, recursion is not so space efficient a lot of the time is because each stack frame has to be held in memory simultaneously, right? Uh, just from the way that a stack works, let's, let's go back a few frames, right? Uh, let's imagine that I had like five, or let's say, you know, this thing was a recursive algorithm that was six layers deep, right? Uh, well, in order to do this recursive algorithm, I would need six things on my stack simultaneously, right? Uh, I need all of them at the same time, which means that I, I need at least that much space in order to conduct my algorithm, right? Whereas there are a lot of algorithms that if you do them iteratively, you just need like one variable. You combine everything up at the same time. You don't need like six variables. You just need one. But in recursion, depending on how you're doing your recursion, if it's not so smart, uh, very often, you can very easily end up allocating way more space where you have these like really dense stack frames, um, and it just ends up taking a lot more space. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why recursion is often not as desirable as iteration because of the space efficiency, um, and you also get some time complexity issues as well if you're not careful. So recursion can very easily be much much worse than the iterative solution to an algorithm. You know, saying all this. It might sound like, well, geez, recursion sounds like it really sucks, and it's really hard, and it's really annoying to debug. You know, why would you ever want to use recursion? Um, again, like there are cases that I that I have not shown you where recursion is a much easier way to solve the problem than iteration. Um, and again, like trees are are the quintessential example of a recursive data structure that just begs to use recursion, where you can solve problems in like two or three lines as opposed to in you know twenty or thirty. Um, but it's, it's always important to be mindful that you, you often need to be more careful with a recursive algorithm to make sure that it's more, that it is uh, space efficient and time efficient. Um, usually there is an efficient way to solve the problem with the same time and space guarantees using recursion as with iteration. Um, but sometimes they require tail recursion. Sometimes they require uh, some more tricky ways of passing data around. Um, we're not going to look at that today, but it's just something to be mindful of when you're, when you're looking at the trade-offs between recursive and iterative algorithms. Yeah, so each stack frame has to be held in memory. And if you can't let go of it, then this means that memory is going to build. Um, and the other thing to remember is that each stack frame gets evaluated one by one, right? So when I have this large tower of stack frames, um, I got to go through them one at a time and, and solve every single one of them. So if you, uh, it's also true that every recursive algorithm uh, so pretty much every recursive algorithm we've looked at so far, well, no, okay, so I take that back. A couple of the recursive algorithms we use so far are really easy to model iteratively, right? Um, some of them are not so easy to model iteratively. Uh, so for example, like, you know, reverse a string, that was, uh, the way that we use that recursive algorithm was not that easy to model iteratively. Um, like the, the, you know, triplets algorithm, that one to find an iterative version of that, like, the iterative algorithm is just different. It's just not the same thing as the recursive algorithm, right? Uh, but there are sometimes when the recursive algorithm is just basically basically the same thing as the iteration algorithm. Uh, it just uses recursion as a form of iteration. But there are times when recursive algorithms are just genuinely different, right? Uh, so, you know, for example, I think the triplets algorithm was just genuinely different, or like the the uh, you know the palindrome example maybe was just like genuinely different than the recursive the recursive algorithm. Or sorry, the iterative algorithm. So in those cases, when the recursive algorithm is just different from the, the iterative algorithm, um, then one might ask the question is, can you implement that algorithm without using recursion? Like, is, is recursion the only way to use that algorithm? Uh, the answer is no. Any algorithm that can be solved recursively can also be solved iteratively. Doesn't matter, There's, there are no exceptions to this. All recursive algorithms can be implemented iteratively. Um, the, the reverse is not true necessarily, but uh, the, the counterpart is true. So because all recursive algorithms use a stack, right? because they use the stack, they basically have this stack structure underlying them, and that is basically what's orchestrating this algorithm. 
is stack frames are orchestrating this algorithm. So th what that actually means is that every recursive algorithm implicitly uses a stack, which is a little bit mind bending. It's a little bit kind of like, oh yeah, I guess that's kind of true. Um, but it absolutely is true. Every recursive algorithm that uses recursion, what that means is that it's using a stack. It's using a stack to do whatever it is it's doing, okay? What that means is that often if you want to implement a recursive algorithm that is primarily recursive, meaning that it's not just like a recursive way to do iteration, if you want to implement a recursive algorithm iteratively, you often need to manage your own stack. Basically meaning that you need to like emulate the stack by pushing things onto it, popping things off, then evaluating the top thing on the stack and then popping that off and then evaluating the top thing on the stack. You basically need to do the same thing that the stack is doing for you, that the programming language is doing for you. Basically, if you think about it this way, recursion is just sort of using the programming language's stack to solve your problem more easily using a stack. Think about it that way, again, a little bit mind bending but that, that is a valid way of representing what's going on in recursion. And any recursive algorithm you can solve using a stack. Uh, I'm not gonna demo that, but I can, uh, I can actually demo that afterwards if people are interested in seeing an example of how this works. Um, but this is true, you know, so a lot of algorithms that are very hard to implement iteratively, like merge sort, quick sort, uh, a lot of tree problems are, are quite difficult to do iteratively. Um, depth first search is another example of something that is very simple recursively. Iteratively, it sucks and it's much more complicated. Um, the way you do those iteratively is you have to use a stack and manage it yourself. Uh, and you can do it, but it's really gnarly. It's like much more... Uh, counterintuitive than doing it recursively. So, any questions on that? Uh, just kind of wanted to give more background here on recursion and uh, the, the, the trade offs between recursion and iteration. Any questions at all? Feel free to toss them into the chat. <clears throat> Sounds like everyone's getting this. Is anyone? Is anyone like totally lost or people doing okay? Can I just get a gauge real quick of how people are feeling about this information if they're mostly grasping it, if there's stuff that doesn't really make sense? Forrest says, makes sense. It's very interesting and helpful, that's great. Uh, I don't really get what manage your own stack means. Okay, yeah, so good question. So when I say manage your own stack, what I mean is, um, you know, let's say that I'm trying to do, um, uh, let me, I, I, I guess let's, let's think of the example of uh, palindromes, right? So in palindrome, we had these subproblems which were, you know, the inner word, right? So uh, it was, uh, let, me, let me jump out of this. Uh, do, 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 let me, let me just come down here so I can show you more clearly what I mean. Uh, so for palindromes, we had, Palindromes of you know ABBA, right? We had palindromes, and that's ABCCA. Okay, so for palindromes of ABBA, we had or ABCCA, we had um, you know palindromes of BCCB, then we had palindromes of B or sorry, CC, and then palindromes of empty string, right? So what we would do if we were managing our own stack is we basically have like a stack equals empty array, and then we would say you know stack dot push, uh, you know. Uh, B C C B. Okay. And actually it'd be like, yeah, I guess it'd be stack up push. Okay. Uh, we'd stack up push B C C B. And then we would inside of whatever we were doing, we would end up stacked up pushing uh, C C. And then we would stack up push empty string. And then we would just pop things off the stack and evaluate them one by one. Okay. Uh, so we'd do you a stack dot pop. Uh, and then we would say, we would check to see, you know, is this a palindrome? Or are the outside layers of palindrome, right? We check the base cases. So I'll, I'll, I'll demo this afterwards uh, to show exactly how you would do this, manually managing your own stack. But this is what I mean by manually managing it. Um, yeah, cool. Glad that makes sense. Uh, all right, so let's jump back into here. Cool. Uh, so Eric Tang says, talk about recursion and nested loops. Uh, so this is an interesting question. So. Nested loops are something you generally would not want to model with recursion. So recursion, you know, um, most loops can be replaced with recursion, but most loops you actually would not want to replace with recursion. 
So something like a doubly nested loop is a horrible candidate for recursion because there's nothing really that recursion gives you, right? Like if, if what you want to do is loop, then you should loop. Don't use recursion because recursion is just like a more complicated way that's less efficient for looping. Uh, looping is fine. Just loop if you want to loop. Um, if what you want to do is try to solve a problem and you know how to solve a subproblem, then great. That's recursion. That's what you want to do. Uh, you can, again, you can loop recursively. If all you want to do is just sort of you know, emulate iteration with recursion, you can do that. But it's a pretty bad candidate for uh, using recursion is just to emulate a loop. Does that make sense? Um, so it's kind of like thinking about when would you want to use recursion and when would you want to use iteration. Um, if you can very easily think about how to solve the subproblems with uh, recursion, then, oh, I see. OK, OK. So, so Eric Tan clarifies by saying he's talking about combinatorics. So uh, this, is a, this is a good point. There are a lot of combinatoric problems that require you to do a loop inside of a recursive call. Um, so usually when this happens, you get some kind of crazy explosion in uh, the number of recursive calls that you get, uh, which is why combinatorics are usually very expensive to calculate. Um, but so let me give you, um, let me think here. OK, yeah. So basically, an example of what I'm talking about, uh, this, this is not an uncommon pattern if you're trying to evaluate something combinatoric, is you might say, you know, like, function combinatoric uh, that takes in, like, a string, OK? And then what you would do is you would do something like, uh, you know, uh, for, you know, let i equal 0, i is less than string dot length, i plus plus, OK? So you'd for loop over the string. And then inside the for loop, you would do stuff, and then you would call uh, you know, combinatoric of some other string, right? And so you'd have inside of each recursive call tons of recursive calls, right? Uh, this is a common pattern if you're trying to do permutations. Uh, permutations is uh, somewhat common, um, some, somewhat common interview problem. Subsets is kind of something, actually, no, with subsets, subsets is purely recursive, I think. Um, but uh, permutations is a good example of one where you would you would use this kind of pattern, where you have tons of recursive calls inside each recursive call, which gives you this recursive explosion. That's why combinatorics, so you know, permutations, actually has factorial complexity, which is really really bad. It's extremely slow. Um, so we can I can I can demo that a bit later if people are interested as well after the presentation is over. Cool. So uh, let's. Well, cool. Here's here's cool. This guy is very cool, and that's cool. Okay, so uh, last thing I want to talk about is how do we calculate the big O of a recursive algorithm? Again, those of you who are not present or need a quick refresher, big O is basically the time complexity. It's just like an order of magnitude, kind of like an order, polynomial order, um, of basically how long does this thing take relative to the size of the input? How long does this function take to compute? relative to the input size. So the way you compute it is, the easiest way to think about it is the number of stack frames times the average runtime per stack frame. OK? Um, this is potentially not super clear what this means. Um, and we're going to look at uh, an example of this shortly. But this is just the easiest equation to think about. OK? How many stack frames are you going to have? And how long is it going to take, on average, for each of those stack frames? If you just multiply those two together, then you'll get the overall running time. Um, it does get a bit more complicated that, than that, but that's a good starting point. Um, there are a number of more, like you know, finding the running time of a recursive algorithm can be very complicated. So uh, there are things like the master method, uh, recurrences, recursion trees that you can use to analyze these. If you're really curious, you can go look these things up uh, and learn more about them. Um, but you get into a lot of mathematics the more you try to analyze recursion, because it can get pretty complicated. But most of the instances that we've looked at are pretty easy to, to analyze. Um, but it can get pretty arcane with some really complicated uh, recurrences. So cool. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a sort of demo analysis of a recursive algorithm. Okay. Uh, and so for this, let's, uh, what, are, what are we going to do? Let's look at join. I think join is probably the easiest for us to, to look at. Okay. So does that, I hope everyone remembers join. Uh, very simple. It just you know, joins these strings together with whatever is the um, whatever is the separator that we throw in there. Um, so 
I want to use join. Actually, no, no. Let me not use join. I'd rather use triplets. Let's use triplets. Okay. So the question is, what is the runtime here of triplets? What are all the stack frames like? Uh, you know, the way we're thinking about this is, you know, uh, number of stack frames oops, times uh, average runtime per frame. Okay. Cool. So runtime of this algorithm. Uh, so let's look at all the stack frames. So the stack frame will start as so we start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? That's our first array that we pass in. Check to see are you less than or equal to three, which it's not, of course. Uh, so it returns array.slice from zero to three. How long does this take? Well, this would just be a one because we're always just grabbing a subarray of a constant size. We're always grabbing three things. Um, so we have inside of one stack frame, uh, we have like this O1 operation. Uh, and then we concat this triplets of something else, okay? Uh, and so I'll just tell you now that basically concat is essentially O1. So we have some other O1 operation, okay? When you're analyzing the big O, so one thing you notice I didn't say was how long this triplets of this other array took. Oh, sorry. This array.slice3, uh, this is the other thing that happens inside of here. Uh, we have to slice this array to get everything past the first three elements, right? So we got to get uh, this subarray. How, do we, how long does it take to get this subarray? Well, it turns out it takes O1 time, OK? Um, and the reason why is because basically JavaScript is smart enough to know that basically like it's, it can just sort of point to the same list in memory, but uh, only from this index forward, OK? Does that kind of make sense? So instead of like creating a whole new array and copying uh, you know, four, and then five, and then six, and then seven, and eight, one by one, that would be ON. That would be a linear operation because I have to copy each new element to a new place in memory by creating this new array. But JavaScript is smarter than that. Because it sees that I'm just slicing this array, um, it's just going to say, okay, you know what I'm going to do is create this new array. And what this new array is just going to do is just going to point to this array up here, pretending that this is index zero. Does that make sense? Uh, it's, just, it's just sort of smart enough to be kind of lazy about it and not actually make a new array unless it absolutely has to if the first array gets modified. Okay, so this is called copy on write optimization. Uh, copy on write optimization. So you can uh, optimization, which is something you can look into if you're curious. But basically, this is also a one. So we have two O one operations. We've got the array dot slice. Uh, we've got a concat, and we've got this array dot slice three. So this is just all O one operations. Okay. Now notice I didn't say how long it took to do the triplets of the rest of this. Okay. When you're analyzing a recursive algorithm, you don't analyze. You don't try to put it all together. You only analyze uh, the the part that's is sort of only within this stack frame itself. Um, so Jason Terr asks, "Did you say it's also smart enough to know if the original array is modified? The reference to know to create a new array? Yes, it yes it is intelligent enough to do that, Jason. So if I change this array in any way, if I modify it by deleting an element, changing the value inside of an element, that will trigger a copy for this array right here. That is basically how copy and write optimization works. Um, so it will say, oh shit, you know, the parent that I was pointing to changed. So I've got to freeze everything and go, oh God, I got to copy everything. Okay, four, five, six, seven, eight, cool. Now you go ahead and change. You, you can go ahead and mutate now because I've copied everything I need, right? So you can imagine this array sort of has like an array of callbacks, which are all of the, the sort of children arrays that need to copy if I mutate. Um, this is basically how copy and write optimization works underneath the hood. Not super important to understand that. If that went over your head, don't worry about it. Uh, but this is basically what's going on underneath the hood and why these operations, these slices, are a one. Uh, why they're not a one, even though the arrays that they're creating are linear in length relative to the original array. Cool. That was a lot of talking. Um, so this stack frame right here was O1 plus O1 plus O1. Right, because all I do is I slice, I concat, and I slice. Cool. Now I recurse, of course, on array dot slice three, which would be you know uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. What happens in this stack frame? Well, I get a one uh, because you know I, this doesn't happen yet. It's uh, array dot length is not less than equal to three. And of course, if if the previous stack frame was a one, this one's also be a one operations because uh, it's only looking at these three elements when I slice, slicing the rest, which is copy on write optimization, and then concatting them together. This is O1 plus O1 plus O1. Cool. Then it goes one more stack frame. So it goes uh, 
So it, it slices the last things off, so seven and eight. And then this triggers this base case, uh, which just returns the array inside of a nested array. Uh, and so this should be a one plus, or just a one, right? Because it just returns the array inside of an array. Um, so this is also a one. And that's it. This is everything inside of my function. Okay. Um, so you can see for each stack frame, the average runtime is a one because you just add a bunch of O1 operations together. So this stack frame is a one, this stack frame is a one, and this stack frame is a one. So we've got this average runtime per frame is a one. How many stack frames do I have? Anyone want to guess the number of stack frames that I'm going to get for this triplets function? Um, Camila says the string is down, or sorry, the stream is down. Uh, can other people still see the stream? I can still see it, so I don't know if it's just for her. Yeah, uh, Camilla, you want, might want to try refreshing if it's down for you. Uh, so Force asks, why doesn't uh, the base case get counted until it executes? Doesn't computer need to calculate it even if it doesn't trigger? Uh, yes, it does. It does need to calculate it, Forest, but it's O1 to calculate. So that's basically just another O1 that I need to add if I was need to do that check conditional. So uh, yeah, it's impossible to like count the number of O1 operations, right? Because I could say like, oh well, you know, looking up the length is O1, and then doing this comparison is O1, and then instantiating this three is O1, and this if is O1, and then this return statement is O1, and then putting this in array is O1, right? You can count the O1s as far as you want to. Like the point is that the whole thing is O1. Um, it's just more of an exercise to kind of say that each of these three operations are O1, therefore they combine to also be O1. Does that make sense? Um, so don't get too crazy with like counting your O1s, because obviously they all converge into altogether being O1, uh, because they don't depend on the input in any way. So uh, does anyone want to guess the number of stack frames? Like how many stack frames am I going to get on average for triplets? Does anyone want to tell me? Any idea? Anybody? Doesn't it depend on the length of the input? It does, exactly. Yes, Jason Terra's got it right. It depends on the length of the input. It's n divided by three. Because each time that I take a triplet, right, I'm going to take off uh, uh, three elements at a time, and I'm going to keep taking off three elements at a time until I get all the way to the end. That, how many times is that going to take? n divided by three. How many threes are in this array is exactly how long it's going to take me to take it off three by three by three by three by three. So the number of stack frames is O of n divided by three times O1. n divided by three is just a constant. It's, it's being divided by a constant. So this becomes ON times O1, which of course just becomes ON, which tells me that this algorithm is ON. This is an ON linear time algorithm, which is exactly what I'd expect out of the iterative version of this algorithm as well. Now the space complexity here, does anyone want to tell me what they think the space complexity would be? Space complexity can be sometimes a little bit trickier uh, in recursive algorithms. It, it quite often is. Uh, but does anyone want to guess what the space complexity is here? Like how much memory is this thing going to take? The, the equation for space complexity is very similar to, uh, it was essentially totally analogous to this. It would just be average space per frame. The number of stack frames times average space per frame, well, number of stack frames we just established is O of n divided by three. What is the average space per frame? Does anyone want to tell me? Anyone have an idea? How much space does each stack frame take on average? Yes, Jason Terra guesses n divided by three, and he's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no. Uh, not n divided by three. Uh, that is not correct. So let's look at this really clearly. What how much space does it take per frame? So inside of a stack frame, right? Inside of this stack frame, if I look at the amount of space I have, well, I don't need any more space for the input. Okay, this is, this is important in understanding space complexity, right? Uh, even though the input is like you know eight elements big, I don't need eight elements of memory in order to run this function because I already have that, right? When I call the triplets function, if I call triplets with this uh, array. This array already exists. I don't need any more memory because I call the function, right? So uh, this function does not require, you know, this array does not require any more memory than it's already there. So I can ignore that. Any arguments you don't factor into the space complexity. Uh, this doesn't require me to do any space, so this is fine. Um, this part here, so I'm taking this 
a ray dot slice from zero to three, that's O1, right? It's O1 space because it's only three elements. It's never going to be more than three elements. Doesn't matter how big the array is. Doesn't matter if the array is a billion elements. It's always three elements uh, that I'm putting into this array. So that's going to be O1. Um, now, for this part here, uh, I'm going to be ah, okay. So this is interesting. So uh, for this part here, I'm going to concat onto this array, which is O1 in size, uh, this thing here, OK? So this array, so this is kind of like recursive a little bit, right? Like how much space does this triplets take? Well, let's not worry about that for the moment. Uh, let's just say, let's just look here. This array dot slice 3, uh, this is also going to be constant space because O1 oh, space, because we established that because of copy and write optimization, it doesn't copy every single element. It just sort of has a pointer to where it originally lived, right? So this array dot slice three is going to be O1. Oh, so cool, all right? So I've got uh, this O1, oh, this O1, oh, and I can just uh, kind of ignore this for the moment. Um, and now I'm just gonna be thinking about, all right, so I've got this O1 oh, thing, I take this O1 oh, slice, now what happens when I concat these two things together? Okay, what does concat do? Uh, so it, it it kind of depends on the way that concat works. So if you have this you know this array, uh, let's say a equals a, and we'll say b equals b. Okay, if I say a dot concat b with a. A is the same. B is the same. But a dot concat b created a new array that was neither a nor b. Okay, for it to do that, it has to copy everything in the two arrays, right? That's really the only way that it could work. Um, so a dot concat b creates a new array that's the size of everything in here, right? So this concat actually creates a new array that's the size of the recursive call plus three elements. So this is not good. This is this is bad. Um, there's a way to solve this if we can just unshift, but I don't actually I don't actually know how to unshift in JavaScript. Um, there is a way to unshift in JavaScript, right? In, in, in a JavaScript array, does anybody know? Yeah, it's just is it not unshift? Array dot unshift. Ah, because it returns a number. That's why. Ah, oh, that's annoying. Okay, well, if we use unshift, then we can make this less ugly. Um, but the way that it's currently written with concat, this actually takes O n space on every stack frame. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you exactly why that is. Um, so right here, this bottom stack frame, because it has to recombine everything into this final recursive uh, output, is O n. This one is like O of n minus three, and then this one is O of n o of n minus six space, right? And then this one will be O of n minus nine, and so on and so on, right? Da 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 da, da until it gets to O of uh, O of one. Does that make sense? Like when I get to the very, very bottom, it's going to be just like two elements or one element or whatever, um, and it's going to become really small. So the question is, what is this series equal? What's the average amount of space that I'm taking up per stack frame? Well, it's you know whatever is right in the middle. Right, and whatever can be right in the middle because this is a descending sequence exactly n divided by two. Somewhere in the middle is going to be n divided by two, and this is the average amount of space that this sequence takes per stack frame in terms of space. So I get n divided by three, the number of stack frames, times n divided by two for the amount of space, which means this is n. Whoops, the total amount of space is n cubed divided, or sorry, n squared divided by six, which reduces to n squared. This algorithm, as I've written it, using concat, is n squared in terms of space. This is very space inefficient. So this is exactly the, the kind of example that I was alluding to when I, when I was saying that uh, recursion can be much less efficient than iteration. Right? You would never write an iterative version of this algorithm that took quadratic space. That's crazy. No one would ever do that. Um, but you can solve this problem uh, well, actually, okay, at the moment, you kind of can't solve this problem because unshift is actually O-N in JavaScript. But there are ways to get around it. Um, you could 
it's kind of ugly how you'd solve this, but basically if you had like, uh, if you were pushing on this and then you reverse it at the end, um, then I think this would work. So let's try this. Uh, let me, let me, let me just see if this works and just uh, try to appease my intuition here. Uh, let's give this a shot. So node two, oh, I got palindrome statement. Okay. Oh yeah, that's right. So push returns a ah. Okay, so I'll say uh, const um. Let's see here. Triplets equals this. All right. Oh, that's a namespace collision. Uh, triplets array. All right. This is this is horrible. Don't do this. Really bad naming. And then return triplets array. People are following what I'm doing here. Run this. Uh, base case is no longer working. Hmm. Do, 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 do. Let me see here. It returns an object for the base case. Interesting. Um, let's see here. A, uh, see what's going on here. Comes the log JSON dot string phi. So this is an example of where I'd want to console log to figure out what's going on in my base case. And it's seven eight. So what? Yeah, that's what I want. What's the problem? Why does it say object? Uh, dot push. Oh, uh, I think I no longer nested an array. Ah, uh, yeah, because I'm using push and not concat anymore. That's why. There we go. Yes. So, uh, so, so now I've got it working with push instead of concat. Uh, and now I'm pretty sure this is a one space instead of a one space. Uh, let me do this. This is one of the reasons why JavaScript can be quite annoying is that you can't do it quite so elegant anymore because you have to just push doesn't return the array that you pushed into uh, for whatever reason. But this is nice now. We can we can sort of uh, um, get this to be O n space and O n time, which is exactly what you'd expect from the iterative version. But because we're now using push instead of using concat. Um, push is basically just going to push this other uh... hold on a sec, no, this is not correct <laughs> this is not correct uh, I'm sorry here's why this is not correct um, this is not correct because of this nesting right here Okay, uh, if you'll notice, this is like one, two, three and then this nesting thing Okay. Which is uh, which is not what I wanted. So this is this is not right. This is why pushing uh, the way that I've done it right here will not be sufficient. What I need to do is push each of the triplets into this array. Um, so what I could do is I could say uh, I could say triplets dot for each um, triplet. And uh, it's right uh, oh, whoops, uh, not triplets. There we go. That's what I want. Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'm getting this array within an array. I don't know if you guys can see this, uh, but basically. Like this should be array one, two, three, array four, five, six, but I'm getting this nested array that has four, five, six, and seven, eight inside of it. Um, so if I did even more layers, you would see more and more deeply nested recursion here, uh, deeply nested arrays, which is not what I want. Now, <laughs> now I've got to go back to what I had before of this returned array. There we go. Now I've actually got this working uh, using 
push instead of concat. Uh, and with push, now this is, uh, now this is, no, this is back to what it was. <laughs> okay, this is actually still uh, ln squared, but it's just using push instead of concat. Because, again, each of these triplets array is just being used in the in the scope above it or in the in the uh, in the thing above it. Yeah. Okay. So there is a way to make this uh, o o n space instead of a one space. Um, let me demo it afterwards because right now I feel like I'm taking up too much time uh, focusing on this thing in particular. Um, if you had a uh, fast unshift, then this would be easier. Um, but for now, let's not worry about it. Let's say this is this is fine, and we'll look at an example of how to get this O1 um, in a later examination. But if we could get each stack frame to go down to O1 space or O1 time, then we could basically get the number of uh, we could basically get the running time or the space complexity down to O n. Okay. But any time, basically the the running time or the space complexity of a recursive function is bounded by the number of stack frames. Okay. You can never do better than the number of stack frames because obviously you have to at least push that many things onto the stack, which at least takes all one time for each push, or you have to have that many stack frames on the stack, which is at least that much space. So if, if it's you know half the size of the input or a quarter of the size of the input or exactly the size of the input, um, then that means that your recursive algorithm takes at least that amount of time. So you know it's essentially impossible to have a recursive algorithm that's all one. Um, and uh, there are some recursive algorithms that are logarithmic uh, or sublinear, but uh, you know, I'd say the majority of recursive algorithms tend to be linear, or the majority of good recursive algorithms tend to be linear, where you have as many stack frames or a proportional number of stack frames to the size of your input. Uh, and if it's particularly worse than that, then that what that's going to mean is that the average amount of work you do per stack frame is more than a one. If you have anything more than a one, so you have like n, then you're going to get n squared as your running time. And if you have, uh, you know, uh, so for example, sorting algorithms, you can actually do an analysis of, of sorting algorithms to see this. Um, well, actually, this is not going to show you, but uh, some algorithms that have n log n running time, if you have log n per stack frame, then you'll have n log n as your big O running time. Does that make sense? So this is just a very simple way to conceptualize the running time of recursive algorithms. Cool. So that is, uh, that's our analysis of recursive running time. Um, so for our final uh, problem set, what I'm going to do now is basically it's kind of a little bit of self-guided work. So what I'd like you to do is uh, go ahead and finish any other recursive algorithms that you didn't get to complete uh, in time. and I would also like you to try to annotate the different recursive algorithms to see if you can figure out what their uh, time complexity is, uh, and then also see if you can figure out their space complexity. Okay, uh, some of them are tricky, but uh, try to see if you can figure it out. And we'll take uh, a little bit of time, not too much, and uh, check back in and see where everyone is at. So, any questions before we jump into the uh, exercise part two? Questions, questions? We good? Okay, so uh, let's jump out here. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, mark out the session and move to uh, exercise two. So I'm gonna invite you all to that session. Give me one moment here.